the voice of ESG. Hello everyone and thank you for listening to RSM's Voice of ESG podcast. My name is Gideon Lond and with me are two of our directors uh, of co- uh, corporate governance and culture, Marlene Jans and Susanne de Boer. Uh, thanks a lot for, uh, for being here today and sharing uh, your knowledge with us. Glad to be here, thank you. Thank you. Today we will be discussing compliance, governance and culture and specifically the connection of these topics in uh, connection to improving ESG performance of companies. Uh, so Marlene, to start off, what exactly do we mean with compliance, governance and culture? Well, those are quite a, uh, tough topics, to be honest. Um, with compliance, we normally tend to focus on compliance with laws and regulations. But on the other hand, the compliance function has developed ma- very much in the area of um, uh, protecting the integrity of a company, of, of an organization, of a company. And uh, protecting uh, the integrity, b- corporate integrity, is much more than only a f- clear focus on laws and regulations. So um, there's a lot more to do. And that's um, uh, where also culture com- comes in, because when you see that um, the culture is, is, well, you could easily define things like, well, this is the way we do things around here. I mean, but Susanna will tell a lot more about uh, the culture in this area. And um, uh, if you want to have an, uh, uh, an ethical, a solid, a, a resilient company in place, you need, first of all, to focus on uh, your regulatory requirements and your legal requirements, of course. Um, but it's not sufficient to, uh, uh, to pile up all those laws and regulations and policies and instructions because uh, that does, it's not a guarantee that you will do the right things in the right way. So that's where you need also to have a, a solid corporate culture in place and solid behavior of employees and in order to make that work where you need to have a solid corporate governance so uh, make sure you have uh, your checks and balances in place uh, do is your supervision uh, approach in order do you have the right policies uh, procedures etc etc i'm sure suzanne has a lot more to add on this Well, what I would like to add is that compliance is, as Marlene said, often um, focusing on rules and regulations, but it has matured into the focus also on the soft side of organizations as culture is a very strong um, uh, driver of company success. And if you have a good culture, and then of course the question is define good, um, it will help you in achieving your results. And then... Uh, You need to governance because a culture cannot go without structure. You need to have a structural, structured approach to improving the culture of your company. Is there a clear connection between the the culture and governance and why it's so important, especially for uh, ESG or uh, improving ESG performance? Well, I would say yes, because also in the field of ESG, you can choose two ways to deal with it. You can be completely compliant, so making sure that you adhere to all the rules that are relevant and that you need to adhere to. But the question is, is that really going to change Uh, your behavior as a company and your company culture is very important then in achieving the results and making sure that your company is more than just being compliant to the rules and if you have a company culture that is focusing on improving and taking into account all societal responsibility you have a bigger chance of success on the long run than when you're only adhering to the rules or what might also be called nowadays uh, greenwashing. Marlene, do you have anything to to add to that? Well, I mean, uh, Susanna's, uh, her message is pretty clear, I think. And indeed, uh, um, the uh, developments around ESG um, actually um, contain uh, an immense transition in in itself. So um, if you're talking about transition, about change, it, um, it all starts with your culture and with behavior of people. Are you willing to change? Are you able to change? What do you need to maintain uh, the, the changes you want to make and to really assure that uh, uh, to ensure that um, um, it will be um, uh, developed between the years of your employees. It will be an intrinsic driven change and it all starts with uh, who we are, where, how we feel comfortable, where we want to be. Uh, so actually, yeah, to add on that, it is, it requires a different mindset. It needs you focus, you shift from just achieving the results to achieving sustainable results in which all um, 
uh, interest of stakeholders are taken into consideration and not only the uh, interest of the shareholders. And that is sometimes difficult for companies, but will get you there in the long run if you manage to make that to change the mindset. And if you have a different mindset in the top of the organization, it will trickle down to your staff as well and change the culture. Yeah, and indeed, talking about stakeholder and shareholder-driven uh, approaches, um, you see that from the past we are all focusing on um, uh, shareholder focus. Uh, we we want to make profits, we want to pay dividends because then we feel that the company can continue uh, to exist. But now different risks are coming up and if you do not approach them in the right way and only stay focused on paying dividends um, you might lose the battle at the end because then you might not exist at the very long term because if you do not change uh, um, um, in line with all the regular uh, the, 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 uh, the sustainability requirements um, you might not have your platform for existence anymore you might not have your clients anymore because clients will dial someone else your employees will leave you for and choose another company because they feel more comfortable and they say yes we want to take good care of our climate of our environment and if you want to exist um, uh, in many years from now it needs a totally different approach than just to your focus on profits and if we if we look at this change uh, this changing concept of uh, governance compliance and culture uh, what's exactly the difference in those three areas between, let's say, the traditional way of looking at it and the new way that that's needed for uh, improving ESG performance or ESG compliance, for example? Well, I think, um, as we just mentioned, that changing the focus from shareholder value to stakeholder value, that is one of the most important ones. And then uh, acknowledging that your stakeholders is a much broader perspective than just the shareholders, um, especially employees clients and society at large are important stakeholders that should be considered. And uh, we already see in the field of employment that young people tend to choose for companies where they can uh, identify with and where they feel comfortable with and that are sustainable. And um, when companies are not and those are like the basic needs that new employees have. So if you cannot live up to those needs, you might also lose in the war of talent. Um, the same thing is that you need to really, as Marlene also said, you need to be intrinsically motivated to do so. So you should not say and then do something differently as you sometimes see and hear with companies that they have beautiful visions and beautiful uh, folders on how they are um, improving themselves or what their goals are. That, But when you start asking questions, it turns out to be mainly on paper that it all looks so beautiful. Indeed, and in that respect, window dressing is becoming a risk, in fact. And, I mean, it's a bit in line with, with greenwashing, although greenwashing has a different um, uh, aspects in itself, of course. But, indeed, window dressing, um, uh, people will, if people will find out, if they will discover, um, well, I mean, uh, the socials are uh, filled up very fast with the wrong messages. And then repairing a reputation is extremely difficult. I mean, it takes you seconds to break your, to ruin your reputation. Reputation. It takes you for, for forever to build up again. So um, uh, window dressing, yeah, it's uh, you have to be very, very cautious, very careful in this area. Yeah, yeah, I think there's a lot of companies that uh, run into this with the upcoming transparency requirements, for example, which gonna, yeah, which gonna That's tell right. a lot about yes, uh, a lot yes, of companies yes. on uh, on ESG. Yeah. Um, how can governance, for example, contribute to preventing uh, window dressing? Like, how can you? make changes in your governance, for example, to prevent window dressing or mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, yeah. intransparent behavior? Or employees and staff, they always look at the top. And we can put it as simple as it is. It all starts at the top. So the tone at the top is crucial. And uh, the tone at the top is also a matter of culture, but it's also a matter of doing the things you say you do. Practice what you preach. And that's where governance pops in. Because there you can see that if you have a strong leadership in place who are doing the right things and are, who are also drafting and developing their company uh, in line with um, their sayings and, and uh, their statements, then you can see that that could develop to a company that can be trusted in this transition era. Uh, 
And um, uh, so you need to have good uh, uh, checks and balances in place. And then we are talking about the supervisory role, for instance, within a company. You have to, uh, you, you need a strong management, uh, strong leadership uh, who are willing and able, uh, capable to take the right decisions and who have the courage also to take the tough decisions because it will be um, a tough uh, time for tough decisions and you will not be popular every day every second of the day you can't forget about that but you have to focus on your long-term view and to explain clearly why these steps you are taking now are crucial to achieve your long-term uh, goal and um, so Different communication, leadership, uh, uh, tone at the top are required. And we also lay things down in the right p policies and procedures so that people can be a true owner of, um, of the change, for instance, that you can give them a clear commitment and you can give them um, um, uh, some, some true um, backup scenarios. Um, and to add some practical details on that as well, um, as we said, you need a structure. What we found also in um, investigations is that when uh, nowadays responsibilities regarding the ESG topics are often um, diversified throughout the company. So every different parts do different parts. It is. It turned out that if you combine this all into one function who is responsible for the oversight, the monitoring and the changes, that it will have a significant impact on the effectivity of the function. Um, having said that, the one who is going to lead that should also have a special position, maybe com um, comparable to a compliance chief compliance officer and who might have different... Um, a, a role and a position in which he or she need to be taken into consideration when a decision is taken or advice should be asked from this function before a decision is taken. And I think especially in the beginning when you are starting to get used to this new approach, you will need something official to include the ESG topics in your decision making and then somebody should be responsible for addressing those. It can be useful also to add the three lines model in which you also uh, make sure in the policies, as Marlene mentioned already, who is responsible for what and that it is clearly depicted with having one person being mainly responsible for combining all information into one. That might sound like um, the implementation of a position like a chief sustainability officer. That's yeah, that was yeah. what I was thinking yeah. of. Yeah, yeah, great, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, indeed, and in and, and line with um, um, the, the the message, we um, if if you want to have a clear transition in place and you want to have clear leadership, um, one of the examples um, of of the items you could use. Uh, to make things clearly visible is to um, redefine your core values. And if you start talking about your core values in a company, sometimes it's just a paper exercise. I mean, it's uh, someone has developed some core values, nice for your communication, nice for your PR, but that's about it. Um, if you really start redrafting, redeveloping your core values and start reloading them, that's uh, where you have a, a, a very interesting co communication and a discussion with your employees, for instance. You could also discuss them with your in your supply chain, with your stakeholders. And that's where the awareness will increase. And um, we have experienced uh, several times that this is a, um, a process which is working very well. And uh, the awareness creation leads to new steps and new developments and new initiatives. And then you uh, feel that people also on lower levels and within the organization want to take ownership. They want to be part of this transition. And you need a certain level of enthusiasm to get also through the tough parts and the tough decision-making things we were talking about earlier. Yeah, yeah, because I think that touches more upon, the, starting to touch more upon the culture side uh, from governance where it flows into, into culture. Uh, why is that healthy company culture so crucial for, for ESG in, uh, in companies? Well, as I... I uh, mentioned before, you have the hard controls, what is um, depicted by the laws and regulations that you need to adhere to. But there is always this culture side, like how do we do the things around here? And if you want to have a healthy company, one of the most important things is psychological safety. The fact that people feel safe in the company, feel seen and um, uh, uh, cared for, but mainly are open to 
speak up, to discuss and to mention their concerns. If you don't pay uh, attention to this culture, people might not feel safe to speak up, to mention their concerns, and therefore you might miss um, things that are very important for the company, or you might run into risks that could have been uh, prevented when people would have mentioned their concerns. But what is needed to mention your concerns or to speak up? That is that you feel invited to speak up, that when you mention something that people listen to you and take it into consideration, Still, if they take it into consideration, they might choose not to do something with it, not to act on it, but at least they could communicate on the decision that was taken ba based on your concern. Um, another thing is that it's important that people understand the why of the company and the why of the rules and regulations. Otherwise, if you have all rules and regulations because you want to live up to something, but people do not see the relevance um, of this and do not see what it will lead to, they might have a big chance of going trying to go around the rules and regulations to avoid them or to beat the system so it, when you have a lot of rules and regulations it's still important to explain why and what what it would lead to if people do not live up to those rules and regulations that means that you try to set a culture you want to achieve a certain behavior of people but when you find that people are not behaving likewise it is also important to draw a line and to say that that cannot be um accepted that kind of behavior if you don't do that you set a standard people do not live up and you let it go people will be less motivated to do as requested and they might follow the example of the employee who is dodging the rules so therefore it's always important that you first try to explain the why um, enable people to live up to that and then if they do not do it that you do enforce the rules and regulations as to ensure that people understand again the why and see what happens if you do not live up to the rules. The last part is then you need to maybe change the context because you can request all kinds of behavior from people but if the context is not enabling then still they will not be able to show the right behavior because if the time if there's not enough time if the workload is too high, if, they're, if they do not have the appropriate skills, they still might not be able to live up to, the rec to what they should be doing and to show the right behavior. So as a leader, you need to take into consideration, do my people feel safe? Um, do they have, have everything that they need to do the right thing? And what am I going to do if they do not do the right thing? Yeah, and, and indeed in this area, I think that um, also... Um, from, from a top management leadership perspective, um, it's crucial that indeed uh, the management is uh, uh, enforcing uh, if necessary. And there also is a role for the supervisory board, I feel, because if uh, the supervisory board can provide a backup also to the top management, um, they are, of course, the... Um, uh, um, the sparing partners for exe uh, executive committee, for CEOs, etc., um, to de develop new strategies, new approaches, think more out of the box. Um, question is there, do they know what is required, what's necessary? Where do they um, get their know-how to, uh, to fill in their supervisory role? Um, and that's not also from, only from a supervisory point of view or in their advisory role as a sparring partner, but a supervisory board is also the employer of the executive committee and the CEO. And there you could, um, um, you should develop a clear role to define clear key performance indicators, for instance, for their remuneration policies. Because if you have a remuneration in place, which is clearly focused on uh, gaining profit or increasing profit without uh, achieving any goals in the area of sustainability, um, the company will at the end not start moving because, um, well, uh, those are not the KPIs you are being getting paid for. So, um, and that's where you, you need to have a structure. And that's also a part of actually the enforcement uh, policy or philosophy, so to say. Um, so uh, practice what you preach, uh, put your money where your mouth is. And if you do not do so, um, no, you will not be convincing. And um, that will uh, um, be shown at, at the outside of the company. People will start talking and uh, you will not be trustworthy. And especially in such a period of transition, I think trust is key. And trust is indeed... Uh, 
explaining clearly that you are transitioning, that you are changing. What are you going to do, uh, to do? Where do you want to be in two or five years from now? How are you going to do that? And what is needed to get there? And um, so I'm really in favor of defining clear KPIs for all kinds of levels and to enforce them if necessary. Yes. Sounds like a, a complex uh, landscape with a lot of uh, yeah variables, a lot of things to keep in mind for for companies. It is. Are there any standards or guidelines that companies can take to to guide them through this to to have a certain standard where to what to comply with, for example, regarding governance? Well, um, you can see now that there are clear regulatory requirements like the CSRD, which you could perhaps explain a little bit more about yourself, uh, <laughs> as you are the CEO, one, of, <laughs> one of the ESG experts in this area. Um, so it's about uh, translating those legal requirements into clear governance perspectives. And you can, uh, we see more and more in our daily practice that companies are analyzing the regulatory requirements that are coming up now um, but they are struggling with their transition translation into their um, area and for what does it mean for me for my company and um, the next step then is how are we going to do so how are we going uh, to achieve the goals we have we have defined and some companies are struggling with the question uh, what what do we need to do and others have a clear definition and feel well how are we going to get there and what do we need and um, so there are two kinds of well lines in here yeah. yeah and i would like to add it depends of course of the size of your organization because if you are very big multinational you might have to live up to different requirements or you might have maybe more structures in place already that will help you in getting there. If you are a small company or, well, uh, a mid-sized company, it might, what we just told you, might be a bit too much to handle. Uh, so we could maybe uh, add a little manual to our website in which we just explain some basic steps for those companies at least to get an overview or of what they should think of. Um, and then if you have for the bigger companies, you have like the corporate governance code in which also is at least described that they should do something. Uh, but at least there is uh, something is written in the corporate governance code on the responsibilities of companies. And of course, the financial sector is already dealing with lo lo a lot of regulations on governance and that is also covering the topic of ESG indirectly. Then talking about the corporate governance code, um, a new uh, version of the code has been published in December last year and um, chapter one is talking about long-term sustainable developments actually in the company and um, and the government's re uh, governance requirements uh, to achieve those. And there you see that uh, the board is expected uh, to develop a clear plan uh, to work on sustainability to achieve their goals and they should also develop a, a clear policy approach, procedure uh, to make things more practical at the end. Um, of course, it, it also adheres to the uh, normal uh, governance requirements like uh, talking about checks and uh, talking about balances. How do you entail this into your risk management approach? Do you have a clear risk assessment in place? And do you have clear mitigation measures? And how do you define those measures? And there's one element which I would like to address in the code in chapter one. And that's um, which I find very interesting is that um, the code is um, requiring that companies pay a fair share in tax and that they define clearly what is meant with paying a fair share and how are we going to define that fair share and how are we going to make sure that we adhere to this requirement. And I think that's a clear message that uh, we need to have a clear stakeholder focus. I mean, uh, a company is not an island in a big world, but we are always also part of society. We need to take our own responsibility. We need to uh, uh, show that we are our part and we want to all want to contribute to a strong and healthy and sustainable society which is still existing for many many hundred years from to go 
How do you uh, speaking about it? Because it, there's a lot of intrinsic motivation in 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 that, right? How do you uh, experience the motivation of of clients of companies in the in the industry regarding those uh, objectives? For example, are they eager to to engage with those, or is there some resistance in the market? Like, uh, I could imagine that being transparent on taxes, for example, is uh, yeah, odd for a company at at first. It's not uh, something that com- a lot of companies are used to. So yeah. how do you experience that? Well, in general, I would say there are three types of response. One is, I don't see the problem. The second one is, and if I see the problem, what can I do? And the third one, I want to do something, but I don't know how or I don't know where to start. So please help me. And that is actually the the response that I have encountered the most in, in general. Um And you need different approaches, of course, to deal with it. And I think it depends also per company and the type of leadership that is present and maybe the fact if they have to deal with stakeholders and stakeholders' expectations. So it's a complex uh, playing field and it's not easy to find one one size solution or one type of a solution. But I think that even the ones who don't want it yet or don't know how to will start changing in the long run because otherwise they they are going to lose their uh, license to operate even more so um, big parties are um, requiring uh, demanding their suppliers for instance to adhere to a certain uh, sustainability regulations like for instance uh, one f- uh, very very big company who said well yeah we know that your uh, the sustainability requirements like CSRD for instance are not applicable to you but they are applicable to us and we also enforce everyone and our supply chain to adhere to, to the same regulations and please um, show me what you're going to do about it uh, because if not indeed you will be kicked out as a supplier well those are very strong measures that are being taken and i'm sure that will happen more and more often and well you see that at the very large web shops for instance i won't mention any names do you have any advice for those kind of companies that are not directly inf- uh, influenced by uh, by regulations, but are uh, requested by their supply chain partners, for example, to act or to have certain policies in place? Do you have any recommend- recommendations for those companies? Well, that is, of course, a very broad question as there are so much types of organizations, but I would recommend each organization to start to find out that in his or her field of Uh, service what the requirements are as when you're a production company the requirements are different than when you're working with when you're providing services so i think that is one thing you could also ask of course to uh, your customers what they require and ask them to specify what is needed so that you at least have some guidance what to start with and then i should i think you should start to find out um, for yourself, who you want to be as a company, with which interest you have to take into account, uh, what changes you have to make, if you are able to make those changes, and if your employees are able to live up to the new reality, or if they need something additional to be able to do the right thing. Yeah, if I may add, uh, we we too have, for instance, certain requirements from our clients uh, where we have to sign off on a huge list of of requirements and uh, expectations. Um, uh, And if we are not able to sign off on on such a statement, um, we can forget the assignment. Uh, It's just as easy as that. So indeed, it will become a license to operate. Do you see a lot of uh, communication on this? Because in uh, in my experience, companies can sometimes be a little bit uh, closed off, like operate in their own space without too much communication, for example, with supply chain partners. Uh, although that could be a key maybe to, to progress. If you know what your supply chain partners expect of you and will expect mm-hmm. of you in the future, you can together uh, yeah, prepare for that. It would be What's great indeed if you would take a proactive approach w- within the entire supply chain and make sure you have the same requirements in place uh, because then there is trust in the entire supply chain and that's uh, easy to grasp and you know th- uh, w- that you can count on your, your business partners in this area. What we often see is that we, if, uh, if somebody, uh, for instance, a uh, contract is negotiated, that the requirements come in with the terms and conditions that are going joining the contract, and that's um, 
not a very comfortable moment to start talking about these requirements because you really want to start working. You want to get started in a new project or a new assignment or whatever. And if then that might become a real struggle. So it's better to do that up front, to have this discussion much earlier in, in, in the pro in process. Yeah, that's what, what I would also say. I think it would be good also for the, the end companies, I would say, to start partnering with their suppliers, also to reach out to them and to say, okay, if you want to stay in business with us, we are going to need you to change this and that and to um, ensure that if they change, that they still will be um, a supplier to that company. And I'm I'm saying that I am taking that example as what hinders smaller companies is a couple of things. One thing is that is the rule and re rules regulations are um, coming down very fast are, are coming up very fast and it's a lot so as a smaller company i can imagine that you get overwhelmed um, secondly you see that small companies are not always aware and also quite hesitant to start dealing with it because where should you start and then how to do it and you are already so busy with your business as usual so it could help them in trying to um to slice the leg legislation and to see what is really relevant for them. And then a third thing is that they are looking at their competitors and you might become the first mover, which is very honorable and good. But if it means you're going to make an investment and come up with a certain product and that your competitors take advantage of what you did and you might lose your market share. So it is a kind of this, um, this everybody is looking at each other to see what they, what they are going to do and it might be difficult to become a first mover but then if you help each other in the supply chain the benefit of becoming a first mover might be bigger because there is uh, there's going to be a positive result of your changes and that could help them to to motivate we're almost uh, at the end of uh, of our podcast today is there any final comments that you want to share with our listeners on uh, on this topic well, one of the things I uh, hope we could address clearly is the importance of, of the leadership, uh, the tone at the top, the tone from the top. Uh, I mean, that might be a different story. Um, and in this area, also the uh, the role of the of the supervisory board. Um, I really think that for them it's important that they know where to get their know-how. Not that every supervisory board member need, should be an expert on ESG, for instance, but uh, they should be open uh, to, to other experts to make sure that they have the right know-how in place and they know how to start working with it and uh, use that in their supervisory approach. Um, so that's one the comment I would like to make. Yeah, and I would like to end with some practical uh, tips like it might feel now as a huge job that might be hard to deal with but as you cannot eat an elephant at once you should just try to slice it and then eat it part by part so just start at trying to define who you want to be as a company what is needed for this change and then just start taking small steps because each small step will in the end result in getting the getting at where you want to go right thank you very much for that pretty uh, fantastic uh, closing uh statement. Thank you very much Marlene and Susanne for uh, for your time today and for sharing uh, your your knowledge with uh, with our listeners. This was uh, the first podcast on the interesting and com and complex uh, topic of compliance, governance and culture and I'm sure in the future we will uh, do a lot more uh, more specific podcasts on uh, on each of these uh, themes. Yes, we look forward to um, um, uh, going more into detail on several elements we briefly touched upon here today. So um, look forward to speaking to you next time. Thank you. Indeed. Thank you. And uh, to our listeners, have a very good day.